We're to fight like heaven. There are mountains of influence that control the world around us. There are spheres of life. These uh, spheres are government, politics, economy and business, health, medicine, education, media, entertainment, religion, and family. And all of these are challenges. You know, when you climb a mountain, how many of you ever climbed a mountain, right? You like mountains? How many of you like oceans best? All right, how many of you like mountains best? Okay, it's about 50-50. I like them both, depending on the weather, right? And so climbing a mountain takes strength. It takes energy. But when you get to the top, you get to see from that standpoint, right? Well, God has given you the kingdom. And you should be able to see what's going on in the land. You should be able to see what your father's wanting in this time and what you're called to do. So these areas, the enemy has brought all kinds of lies, derision, and problems, and confusion in. And so the mountains of influence are converging in this hour for the end of times. Yes, we're there. I'll show you. And you're needed to influence them for eternity. God put you here in this season for this time, for such a time as this. Amen? You are called. And a culture cannot fall into ruin unless God's people refuse to engage it. Now, we can refuse by being afraid. We can refuse by refusing to look at it. Or we can be so busy and preoccupied with ourselves or other things that we're not seeing what's going on. But someone has a plan. And as I began to study for this book, it was picked out by the publisher. And then when I brought it to them, they said, well, Dorinda, we know Satan's working, but we don't want you to use the names of who he's using, the organizations he's using, nor do we want you to talk about anything doctrinally that other people in the body of Christ may not agree with, like faith, amen? And so we got we to gotta decide where we're going to stand with things, right? And I prayed about it in the early wee hours of the morning. I heard the word lukewarm. I'll spew it out of my mouth. And I thought, wait, the reason we're in some of these messes, the reason the enemy's invaded these areas of culture is because the church hasn't been talking about it. We've been focused on religion, but we've not been focused. And you know, Pastor Gary teaches wonderfully about business and economics and going into that area because there's two areas, I'll tell you, really big areas. Well, there's actually three I can think of. One of them is money. The devil doesn't want us to talk about it in church, doesn't want you to have any, and doesn't want you to use that as influence. Okay, the other area is government. Because he knows if he can control the government, he can actually gag freedom of religion and free speech. And if he can do that, there is no freedom, right? We've been through many countries and ministered in nations that do not have freedom. We've known ministers that have been in prison for five years just for proclaiming the gospel. And so we've got to be wise to the enemy's schemes. He wants to take us out, and he does it by stealing our freedom. It's important. It's for freedom that Christ came. The Bible says, do not be uh, yoked or entangled with the yoke of slavery. Satan is behind slavery. He's the tyrant. He's the manipulator. He's the propagandist. He went to the garden, and he got Adam and Eve off by using propaganda. Did God really say? And there's propaganda going on right now. We've got to guard our families. We've got to guard our hearts. We've got to guard the truth, because it's the truth that sets people free. So a culture can't fall into ruin unless the people of God refuse to engage it. I want to show you a scheme of the enemy. It's set up in the World Economic Forum, and I think we need to know this in the church, because it says in the Bible, do not be ignorant of Satan's schemes. Now, that doesn't mean we're afraid of Satan's schemes, but we need to know our enemy, and we need to know the lies he's using to hurt people's lives. So this group is called the World Economic Forum. It was started as the European Management Forum in 1971. These lies have been propagated for a while. The enemy's been laying this plot, laying this snare, laying this trap for people to step into, to bring down the governments of the world, to bring our freedom to a place of slavery and totalitarian control. That's what Satan's always after. Amen? He did it in the garden. He's doing it today. This group included a thousand leading companies in the world to demonstrate entrepreneurship in the global interest. These are companies like Amazon, Dell Technologies, Google, BlackRock, GE, Intel, Meta, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, PayPal, UBS, and Visa. 
These are economic mountains, and the yearly this group of people meets in a place called Davos, Switzerland. Switzerland. They call it Davos, and they come together with all these global leaders, and they decide and plan our lives. Do you ever hear much about it? No, you really don't. And in the COVID pandemic, the WEF through Schwab said, to achieve a better outcome, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies from education education to social contracts and working conditions. Every country from the U.S. to China must participate. Every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. We must build entirely new foundations for our economic and social systems. God would not have you and I to be ignorant of the, the schemes of the enemy. Schwab has referred to this as the Great Reset, the fourth industrial revolution, a new world order. We have all kinds of politicians that have talked about a new world order. George Bush talked about it recently. Biden talked about it. They're talking about the coming of a new world order. And yet, most of our news, we don't hear these things, right? Everybody's too busy watching Johnny Depp and Amber and their divorce thing, right? Which means absolutely nothing to your life, to the world, to what's going on in the nation. We do not need to let all these fake people with fake news jangle the carrot over here and get us all watching that while they come and bring a reset into our nation. This is serious. Have you heard about much of this on the news? No, they don't want you to hear about it. They've got too busy. You're too busy. All oh, of them are pushing these other things. And this, what, this is what news agencies are doing. Schwab has referred to this as the New World Order, Great Reset, Fourth Written Industrial Revolution. He said this, you will own nothing and be happy. The WEF's twisted plan for a great reset, which includes transhumanism, is articulated through his right-hand man, WEF advisor, Yuval Noah Harari. I had, him on, I had a, a clip on Drenda on Guard about this. Some of you may have seen it if you have it. And uh, Robin Bullock gave a very strong prophetic word at that time. Anyway, what is Yuval Noah Harari? Who is he? Well, let's just say Schwab, Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Harvard, Stanford, and New York Times have revered him and described him as the prophet. Harari speaks at Harvard, Stanford, TED, and Times Talks. Let's hear what he boasts, because I want you to hear it from his own words. I don't want you to go, some conspiracy theory. No, this is the advisor to the World Economic Forum. Check out uh, Dr. Harari. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And if you look at what uh Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, the Young Global Leaders. If you look at his advisor, they call the prophet, Dr. Harari. The prophet. Ooh, you look at the things he said, he uses Jesus Christ's name in it. I mean, all this story about Jesus rising from the dead and being the son of God, this is fake news. Wait, that's not true? You don't have any answer in the Bible what to do when humans are no longer useful to the economy. You need completely new ideologies, completely new religions, and they are likely to emerge from Silicon Valley or from Bangalore and not from uh, uh, the Middle East. And they are likely to, pro to give people visions based on technology. Everything that the old religions promised, uh, happiness and justice and even eternal life, but here on earth, with the help of technology, and not after death, with the help of some supernatural being. And I think that fake news have been with us for thousands of years. Um, just think of the Bible. But there's... <laughs> but, but there is... Yeah, and you we know. don't need a savior. We don't need... And that there's uh, all these is issues about... Uh, uh, you know, there, we, 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 don't, we don't look to some God in the cloud. We look to the cloud where the technology, we get our answers. We don't need to wait for Jesus Christ to come back to earth in order to overcome death. A couple of geeks in the laboratory can do it. Wow, what do you think? 
heresy, blasphemy. I don't know. What do you think of this? This is the advisor to the World Economic Forum that wants to set a great reset for you. You need to know this. We need to know this. I know these aren't like fun things to talk about, but we need to know. And the WEF recruited a group of leaders called Global Leaders for Tomorrow in 1993. They changed the name then. These are the familiar names of today's politics, government heads, 1,400 alumni, Vladimir Putin, Bill Gates, Justin Trudeau, Angela Merkel, President Emmanuel Macron, Governor Gavin Newsom, Tony Blair, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and a whole host of others that are in media and television journalists like George Stephanopoulos, uh, actors like Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, Marissa Mayer, Sergey Brin, Larry Page from Google, Peter Thiel of PayPal, Pierre Amadar of eBay, Jimmy Wells of Wikipedia, Eric Schmidt, a former Google CEO and the chair of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. That should make us all feel really good that this person's over AI, right? Jeff Bezos from Amazon, Jack Ma of Alibaba, Alexander Soros, the son of George Soros, who's donated over 32 billion to do away with borders. David de Rothschild. These are people that are at the World Economic Forum. They're members of this. They're pushing these agendas. And so many things you've seen over the last years, you're like, what's going on? Oh, this is that. And we're told on the news what we're looking at, but it's not what you think it is. In the last two decades, we've seen their alliance tread into every area of life to dominate the world stage. They've stepped into every sphere of influence. Citizens and believers sit back in dismay as they see our rights being taken. They see our uh, bodily autonomy, decisions being made, health decisions, children's education, doctors being told they can't use certain protocols or they can't treat their patients or they can't even speak about it. Censored on social media, censored on YouTube, all the censorship because you have to control Control the narrative. There's only two kingdoms. This is coming from Satan, amen? This is nothing new under the sun, and that's why the church must engage it. We're not talking about politics. We're talking about the government that governs you, what you live under, the freedom of speech that you have. People gave their blood. People died on the battlefield. People have pay, paid a dear price for our freedom. We're a free nation. We have a, we have a constitution, and we're a republic, the only one in the world that has what we have, and that's why God has prospered this nation. But there are forces to divide us so they can conquer us. They want to divide. Jesus said a house divided cannot stand. If you look across the culture, Satan has tried to divide us, male and female. He's tried to divide us by ethnicities. He's tried to divide us by social class warfare. He's creating division and making us turn against our own nation and against God because he wants to bring down this country. The church is the answer. Amen? We're supposed to answer this call. This is a time we are called to speak truth to the lies. Satan has been trying to do this from the beginning. Isaiah 9, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you cut down, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is Satan and the pride that he operates in. And may I say, when you hear Dr. Harari, do you not hear the same kind of message, the same pride that rejects that there is a God and says we can look to ourselves as gods and we He'll create our own eternal life. This is heresy. But God says in his word, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the one who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Those that follow Satan will get his same judgment. That's why the church must speak the truth. That's why we've got to be in the word of God and we've got to be sharing the word of God. We can't tolerate 
tolerate sin and sit back and say, oh, let's just embrace everything and everybody. We love people, but we hate the sin that Satan brings into people's lives that steals, kills, and destroys. And if we want to be the church of Jesus Christ, we have to stand up with the word of Jesus Christ. Amen? And what God calls sin, we call sin. What God says is good, we call good. God calls family good. He said he made them male and female because he sought a godly seed. He said to be fruitful and multiply, but Satan is attacking that. And especially young people, the innocent young people do not know the schemes of Satan. And it's up to you and I to make sure the truth is put out for them, that they understand and see God's Word, God's kingdom, and that the lies of Satan are exposed. Amen? So who do these people use? Okay, there are global organizations, the UN, the WCC, World Council of Churches, the WHO, NATO, the WEF, the EU, the World Trade Organization, the G20, Interpol, ICC. All of these groups are converging and working together toward a plan toward a great reset, a new world order. We've heard it from the mouth of our president. We've heard it from the past presidents. We're in a war with cultural, spiritual, and personal battlefronts. Now, Pastor Gary and I often, we're teaching you how to live victory in your life, in your family, in your finances, in your health. We're tackling these mountains, but what we haven't done a lot is show you what they're trying to do. And so we need to know their schemes. We don't need to be ignorant of what they're trying to accomplish, so we're able to combat those lies. Amen? That's what you have to do. You have to study your enemy, know your enemy, and then you have to be able to say, this is what they're doing, but here's the truth. Amen? So we have to be on guard and fight for family, on guard in our families, on guard to fight for truth, to protect the truth. So we're in a war. There's all kinds of things going on, and everyone has to decide, are they going to stand with the Lord? We were just talking to a pastor in Carolina, and he said, wow, since COVID, our church is down to 400 people. We used to be running 1,700, 1,600. He said, all the divisiveness has caused people to leave church, and we don't know where, you know, we, we all, pastors are like stuck in places where, okay, if we tell the truth, then people are going to get mad at us. If we don't tell the truth, nobody gets saved. And so pastors, leaders are having to make those decisions. And I'm just calling on all pastors, preach and teach what God says and expose these agendas. If you won't talk about them, the enemy is. And if we don't invade these areas, Satan will. And he'll use his people instead of God's people being on the forefront. Amen? Instead of God's people pushing in there and being there. And Satan has purposely tried to remove God's people from every sphere of influence. He's done it through trying to demand them. They have to do this and they have to do that or they can't keep their job or they can't work here. Do you see the enemy is trying to remove the influence of the kingdom of God. He fears you. He fears you. If you know what you have, you know what you possess and you're willing to be bold and courageous, you can make a difference. You can have an impact. So unless we learn to fight like heaven, we'll never kick hell out. And there are only two sides. Which side are you fighting for? Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either gathering with me or you're scattering. And so we, we have to make a decision. Satan's tried to get people throughout history to rebel against God. He did it in the garden, right? Did God really say? He said to Eve, and Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and it brought pain into their life. Whenever we rebel against God, it always brings pain. Look around our culture. Oh my goodness, in a time where we declare there's more freedom, freedom to decide your gender, freedom to do this, freedom to do that, freedom to kill your own babies. In this time, we have more pain, more suicide, more broken lives, more messed up children, more, more horrific things happening than any time in history. Satan's a tyrant. He'll lie to people and then get them to follow that lie into sin. And sin destroys. The wages of sin is death. Satan wants death for people. The Tower of Babel is another example. Come, let us build, they said. We'll build a tower to the heavens. It's a tower of defiance against God. There was a young man named Daniel, and in his day, Israel had sinned. After so many warnings from prophets, they still went into sin, and they would not repent and get right back with God. And so I believe God gave this to Daniel so he would know the time he was living in, and that Babylon that had taken over his nation and taken them into captivity would not forever be the 
on the throne. Amen? He let Daniel see this. Nebuchadnezzar, the evil king of Babylon, had a dream. And Daniel, because he distinguished himself as a man of God who had the spirit of the Lord on the inside of him, he was able to not only interpret the dream, he told Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. He told him what the dream was, and then he was able to interpret it. And he was able to show him the kingdoms that had been and that were to come. And guess what? We are living in the final picture of this statue of empires. We're in the final one. That's where you and I live for such a time. So it shows us where we are in the time. But I believe not only did that dream and that interpretation, was that to encourage Daniel that Babylon would not always rule, but also to show you and I. God was looking into the future, a generation of people that you and I would be and that we would see the captivity in the land. We would see all these crazy things going on and we would know where we are. Amen? In the battle plan. And so this man, Daniel, distinguished himself, and God protected him. Amen? Protected him from the fire. Protected him from the lion's den. He stood strong, and you and I must stand strong just like that. Amen? Filled with the Spirit of the Lord, able to speak the truth, and not ashamed, and not afraid. Amen? A new kingdom is coming. Amen? A new kingdom is coming, but it will not end the way the globalists have planned. And I'm sure it's not going to disappoint you that are faithful. Amen? So let's be faithful. Let's not fall away. Jesus said in the last days that there would be those that would fall away, that there would be perilous times. You know, this week there was a blood moon, and people are looking at the blood moon. There's signs everywhere we turn, everywhere we turn. Be committed. Be so committed. You are not going to miss God. When I was a new believer, I was like, the rapture. I read the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. I was like, I'm not going to miss you, Jesus. And there was a storm that was going on, a dust storm, and you couldn't see to drive 15 feet. I mean, I couldn't see anything. I was like, okay, it's time for the rapture. I'm coming, Jesus. <laughs> Please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. <laughs> You know what? I believe I was born again in that message because I believe I get to see the message come to pass. Amen? The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Daniel 2.44. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another per person or people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. So the way this interpretation ended, Daniel saw a stone stone, the stone the builders rejected, amen, and it came and it crushed all the other kingdoms and ground them into powder, and the kingdom of our God will stand forever, amen. When Jesus came the first time, he came as a baby, humble me, he died a death and was ra he raised from the dead, he was setting up his spiritual kingdom. See, the disciples thought he was going to set up a natural kingdom. They thought he was going to overthrow Rome and set up a kingdom. He set up something far better. He set up a spiritual kingdom that men and women through all of out, through all of going forward and history would be able to receive him as king and be set free from the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of God. But Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he will set up an earthly kingdom, the Bible says, a thousand-year reign. Amen? And the mountain of the Lord, the Bible says, will be beautiful. It will rise above all other mountains, all other empires, all other kingdoms. We're going to go to heaven by the work that Jesus did. But there are rewards. There are rewards for invading the mountains, for climbing the mountains. When I climb a mountain, it may be work getting up there, but when I get up there and see the beauty of that scenery, it's amazing. When you see, the Bible says, I had not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of those that love God what he has prepared for them. Amen? But he reveals it by his spirit. So we have a promise from God, and we have to hold on to that promise and not let go. No matter what the warfare is, no matter what the world economic form is doing, no matter what these uh, evil empires and people are trying to do, now we must push back, amen? We are called to push back because there is a revival, and I believe it's among young people. It's among the young, the ones that have been lied to and told they're not a boy, they're not a girl, and there's a bunch of different genders they can choose, and have been told to have surgeries and take their, their uh, bodily autonomy and to give it to someone else and let them destroy them and sterilize them. I believe there's a revival coming among that generation of people, and it's going to come through you and through me, the church of Jesus Christ. We must preach and teach the kingdom of God for such a time. Amen? 
And just like Mordecai told Esther when she was afraid, he said, if you don't, God will use someone else, but you and your household won't be saved. We must make a decision. My house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be bold for Jesus. The righteous are as bold as a lion, and we're going to serve God. We're not going to compromise. Jesus said the lukewarm church, he would spew it out of his mouth. In Revelation, you can see the churches. Only two were commended. Two of them, the persecuted church that would not bow to the persecution, and the other was the faithful church that refused sin and kept their eyes on the Lord. He said the other churches, he would remove their lampstand if they did not repent. Amen? You've heard my story. I was walking down the sidewalk coming from a fair. I saw a church with a pride flag and all these signs that say, we believe in equity. We believe in equality. We believe in this and that. And I, it, just, it just went off in my spirit. I know Jesus turned over those tables, and I, I know he didn't premeditate that, and I didn't premeditate. I yelled. I said, you believe in everything but the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible, God, you know, and you're going to go to hell if you don't repent. Yeah, I did it. Anyway, and a little man peeked around the corner. I didn't plan it. It just happened, amen? I believe Jesus got in that temple and he saw what they were doing. He knew it was from the spirit of darkness. He knew it was from hell. He flipped those tables over and said, my house will be a house of prayer. My house will not be a house to indoctrinate people into LGBTQ, amen? My, my house will not be a place to indoctrinate people into lies and division and into a new world order. So we hear a lot about transgender, transhumanist, and transhumanism. You heard Harari talking about it. Satan's been trying to sow his seed into the people of God throughout history. He wants your DNA. He wants to take your God mark, your God gene, your God design. He wants to take it. He took it. He tried to take it through the Nephilim back in Genesis 6 where they made it. These are Nephilim, the Bible, Hebrew means fallen ones, fallen ones that were supernatural. So this sounds like to me the fallen angels. Sounds like the demons. They made it in with women but were from the earth and made a giant race. God said he had to judge it. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were heroes because they were so huge. Think about Goliath and David, right? But there's always a stone. God always has a stone for the Goliath. Amen? The capstone, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, you are the stone that God wants to use. Amen? The stone the builders rejected, but we've said yes to him, and God wants to use you in this hour. And just like David was not afraid, he was not ashamed to stand up against Goliath. He said, hey, this giant doesn't have a, a, a covenant with God, but you do. So why are we letting giants in the land stand up against the church when you and I have a covenant with Jesus Christ? Amen? The righteous are as bold as a lion. We are to be bold and courageous, amen? So God saw the wickedness in the earth, and he had to destroy it. But the Bible says that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And when you serve the Lord, you follow his ways, you find favor in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord will protect you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will show you what to do, and he will make you bold and courageous and tell you what to say in the hour you have to say it. Satan wants to destroy human in life, whether it's the unborn baby through abortion or your identity in God. He wants to sterilize young people where they cannot have children. He's into depopulation because he hates the population. He hates God's creation. He especially hates the godly seed children. He's targeted kids and youth because he hates the seed. He wants to come after the children. He wants to harm them and hurt them. You and I are being, we are called we have been called by God to protect the innocents, to protect kids from liars, from thieves. Satan uses people just like God does. Children today are not only being exposed to gender fluidity, they're being experimented with. In media, in schools, in hospitals are pushing these agendas. There are full-blown curriculums to push LGBTQ agenda on children from the time they're little. I mean, I said, when I was in the school, I, I had a hard time. I was confused just walking around the hall trying to find where the bathroom is, what class I'm supposed to be at, what book I'm supposed to have, how to do my penmanship. Can you imagine the horrific uh, indoctrination of children that they're pushing on these little kids, that they may not be a male or a female, that there is no God, that they, they're evolved from some creature or from some goo on the ground. They've stolen the God DNA from these kids, and they're trying 
and indoctrinate them. One of the agendas and one of the curriculums is called the gingerbread person. There's also another one called the unicorn. Why do you think there's all these toys and everything pushed to unicorns, unicorns? They want to indoctrinate these kids everywhere they turn. They go to school. They see the unicorn. They go to the toy store. They see the unicorn. All of this is reinforcing. You might be thinking, oh, it's a cute toy. The devil knows the plot, and it reinforces what the kids saw at school and heard, the gingerbread. They show them, you know, when the doctor, when you were born, the doctor looked at your organs and just called you that gender, but that may not be what you really are. And they go through this whole exploration of their expression and their uh, orientation and what they're attracted to. Little kids, for Pete's sakes. I mean, I was confused all the way through high school about life and everything else. Can you imagine starting with a kindergartner, a first grader, a third grader, or even a 12-year-old or 14-year-old or 16-year-old? This is a lie from the pit of hell. It was concocted by Satan. It was concocted by demon spirits. These are doctrines of demons. The Bible talks about them, right? And sadly, churches have embraced it. We've heard truth uh, is, you know, we need to tolerance, tolerance, tolerance to the place where it's so watered down everything that churches are no longer telling the truth. So Satan uses evil people, and God uses people who follow him to bring the truth. That's why it's important who our friends are. It's important we're in the Bible. It's important we pray in the Spirit that we're at church, that we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Children naturally just look to adults to show them the way to live. I looked to my school teachers. When I was suicidal, I went to the counselor at school because I knew they went to church and I was hoping they'd talk to me. Thankfully, someone got a hold of me, but they weren't allowed to talk to me about their faith. They weren't allowed to have a Bible. And that was when I was in school. Now they're pushing indoctrination on them. When they go to the counselor, they send them to the hospital if they're ADHD or whatever. They put them on medications, which mess up their thinking. They mess up. They're trying to. I'm not, I'm not against the hospital profession. I'm not against people. People do the best they know to do. But there are also people higher up who have uh, agendas against these kids. Amen? So they send them to the hospital. Here, even in our own state, we have six transgender clinics. And in those clinics, they give them the medications, and only transgenders are allowed to work in them because they want them to see the example of someone who's pushing the agenda. And so these people then, they tell them, the parents, if the parents are even involved, they tell the parents that, you know, a, a, a transgender child is better than a dead child. Is that the only two options we have? How about a child that gets delivered by the Spirit of the living God? How about a child that finds love and identity in Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Thank God for my fourth grade teacher who took me to vacation Bible school and I prayed the prayer. Amen? Now, there may have been some confusing things that happened in school after that, but my senior year when I was suicidal, I got back in church. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I've been serving God ever since. Amen? So don't let someone tell you that you were born this way or that way or you have to do these things. Uh, they're lying to you. They're lying. And so these kids are put in these situations where the medical community working together, the sphere of medicine, the sphere of education are working together, and the sphere of media and celebrity culture is pushing this agenda. How do you think they become popular? They get a song that's popular, a message in a song, and that's why they put them number one. Yes, the media industry is controlled. Yes, the celebrity culture is controlled. There are people driving what songs you hear on the radio, what messages you see. Thank God there's independent artists now and people could do some things. But still, even with that, there's control about messages. The Bible says no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Amen? The Word of God makes it clear. We are not to partner with these agendas. We are not to push these agendas. I know ministers personally that the Bill Gates and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to and tried to get them to be a part of what they were doing. See, they understand the seven spheres. They understand they need religion. They understand they need all the groups of people to come together to be able to push this agenda. I knew when I heard it, I was like, this is dangerous. This was before all the stuff we've seen. I was like, no, this is dangerous. They do not have a good agenda. 
They, they have an abortion agenda. We need to be open and our eyes open to the schemes of Satan. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that Satan not outwit us. We're not ignorant of his schemes. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it's foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it, for it is evaluated spiritually. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. So people in darkness do not understand the light. So let me ask you this. Why are you letting them tell you what is right and what is wrong? Why are we letting media corporations and searches and all these things tell us what to believe? Why are we letting agendas that happen in people and in groups, this is what their agenda is, to use energy, economy, equity, and environmentalism to drive these one world agendas. I know when I was in school, they told us that abortion needed to happen, that it was just a blob of tissue, and that if we didn't have abortions and control the population, by the time I was an adult, we would all live in a six-foot by six-foot by six-foot cell, 666. I didn't even put that together back then, amen? But that's what they told me. We are not living in a cell, amen? I look across the world when I fly on a plane. There's land everywhere. There's resources everywhere. But they don't want you to use those resources. They consider them their resources because they are elite. So we need to be wise. From a biblical worldview, God created the earth for men and women. And he set commandments in place and principles to govern life under his leadership. But in a globalist view, the earth is to be worshipped. They worship it. They don't worship God. They worship the earth. And they want to control. There's a greed there. There's a control. It's just like the spirit of Satan that was on the Tower of Babel. Just like the spirit in the garden that lied. Childhood is when people are the most vulnerable. The Bible says we are to protect widows and orphans. Do you know that 78% of children in America are not being raised by a mother and a father? Now, I'm not against any single parents. I applaud you. We're here as the church to support you. But I want to tell you, when 78% of kids are not living in the divine order of what God intended, a husband and a wife raising a child, it creates problems. We have a fatherless problem in our culture. We need you men. Can I get an amen from some men? We need godly men. And we godly women want you to stand up and take leadership. Satan removed male leadership so he could go after the women and the kids. And he caused division to do it. And you know what we also need? We need the expression of different ethnicities in the body of Christ. We are all, yes, amen. We are all the expression of God, a loving God that created us. Like a paintbrush, he made all of us a little different, but we all have the same basic needs, and we all are human beings created in the image and likeness of God. But Satan wants to divide us, to get us to attack each other, but we're not ignorant of his schemes, amen? We're the body of Christ. You're my brother, you're my sister in God, and we need to stand together and not let them divide us because they're out to conquer us. They know what to do to create division. And so two-thirds of Christians come to Jesus before and by age 12. Two-thirds of Christians. So where should the harvest be? It should be among children and youth, because we know if we don't reach them by the time they're 12, that only a third will come after that. And so we've got to go for the children because the devil's going after the kids, amen? He's targeted them. We must say, no, get your hands off of our kids. We'll not give our parental rights to you, Satan. We'll not give up these kids. And if they don't have parents that are helping them, we need to come and be spiritual moms and spiritual dads to them. My heart is passionate about doing more and more outreach. This summer, we're having a summer of salvation. We are getting people saved. We're doing outreaches on our grounds here. We're going to have festivals. We're going to reach out. We're bringing in bands. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to get young people, old people, whoever, saved. Amen? It is an hour of salvation. 
There's five-fold ministry gifts, but I believe in this hour we need the evangelist and the prophet like never before, amen? We need pastors to clean them up and get them all situated and disciple, but we need to evangelize and reach the lost. And we're not going to reach them with some tolerance gospel. When I got born again, I already knew what the feminist movement looked like. I already knew what abortion was like. I needed something different, and I was willing to do whatever it took to follow Jesus. I didn't even know there was such thing as contemporary Christian music. I was willing to sing Maranatha, do whatever, give up my rock and roll, give up all the junk, give up all my friends, because I wanted Jesus, amen? I wanted Jesus more than I wanted the world. So the church, we can use, we can wrap things up and make it attractive to the world, but when they come in the door, there has to be the truth of the gospel or no one gets set free, amen? It's just a country club if there's no power of the gospel, if there's no Holy Spirit. So who brings kids to faith? Parents, 50% of kids, 50% of people came to Jesus through their parents. 29% said it was a children's ministry or children's ministry worker. And 26% said friends were there that brought them to church. Here is a ministry for you right here. If you're looking for ministry, if you're looking to make a difference, this is it. You can reach out and touch somebody and help them come to church. You can invite people. Parents, you can parent your own children. You can keep the lies of Satan off of their life. The public school system is driving an LGBT TQ agenda. Yes, I have young people clapping their hand. Amen. It's happening. And so you've got to open your eyes. Are you going to let your children be in that atmosphere? The Bible says the student, Jesus said this, okay? Jesus said the student will become like his teacher when he's trained. So Christian parents throw their hands up and go, I don't understand. My child was in church on Sunday mornings. Well, yeah, but they were eight hours in the school system every day, five days a week, and they were indoctrinating them into lies from Satan. I know I was indoctrinated. Marxism and socialism being pushed in our school systems for them to hate America and hate the things of God and believe there is no God and not sure what their gender is and all these crazy, crazy ideologies. This is a Marxist playbook. The way you destroy a nation is you cause division. You get in there and you divide people. You get in them fighting each other till they collapse, and then you take over. You remove dads that are strong protectors. You get women to hate the men and shake their fist at the men. You get children, Hitler said, Lenin said, all of these tyrants and uh, dictators said, if you give me the generation of the youth, I can change a nation. That's what they're doing. So let's wake up. So we know that parents are the number one thing. So if you break up parents, now 50% of those kids don't come to Christ. Now if you got the church teaching tolerance instead of truth in the Word of God, and I'm not talking about not showing love. We love people, but we have to be strong on hating the sin. Jesus said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come to you. And so sin, we can't embrace it and say, oh, yeah, we, we are good with that. Oh, yeah, that's fine. God, God loves, you know, love is love. No, that's not what the Word of God says. God is love, and if you love him, you'll forsake the lives of the enemy and follow him. And the church will help people let go of that stuff and get broken, break it off of them and get deliverance. We have deliverance that goes on here. It's called Freedom Encounter, amen? And so 97% of the media are driving a liberal agenda. 97% of the media call themselves far left, call themselves liberal. So if they're doing your news and they're doing your entertainment and they're doing your music, what kind of agenda are you getting? What are you hearing? What are your children hearing? Google controls 92% of all searches. So if you're trying to search, is this true, is this not? And guess what? The same people that own the news agencies own the fact checkers. Have you ever looked at a fact check thing and it starts out, it says false, and then you read down and before you're done with reading it, because they know most people are going to read the word false and the first paragraph and go on. If you keep reading down, down, down further, you'll go, oh my gosh, they almost flipped it at the end and you realize it's open-ended or it's not false. They're lying to us. So we cannot look to fact checkers. We can't look to Google searches. 
They are all, they have an agenda. I showed it to you at the very beginning, right? They're part of that one world economic forum. They use psychological warfare. They use manipulative tactics to intimidate or persuade people. They employ them through propaganda, ideas, statements that are false or exaggerated, and they deliberately spread lies to manipulate people, to incite fear in them, and ultimately to control them. My son Tom was just showing me a new army video, a PSYOP video. It's the creepiest thing I ever saw. If I was able to show it to you, I would. It's shocking. They say we're pulling the strings, and it's showing all the psychological warfare and ghosts coming out of the ground and all these weird stuff because they know if they can control people's minds, what you think on, the Bible says the image you behold is the image you become. Why do you think kids are more and more identifying as uh, non-binary and all these terms they've given it? Why do you think they're doing that? Because that's the image that's constantly being put before them. The more they see these images, the more they identify with it. The more they're celebrity stars, they're JoJo, you know, they're Hannah Montana. They take these actors and actresses and they start them. And you think, oh, this is cute. My kid's like this. She's good. She's okay. And then they come in with an agenda, right? They bring the agenda. They do it with movies. They do it with uh, all these different um, documentaries. They do it with all kinds of things. So you've got to be wise to the enemy's schemes. The goal of the warfare is to intentionally use propaganda to manipulate and break down people's will without using force, right? You break them down. You use the news to infiltrate and to tell them the same, uh, the same narrative. You can turn all these different mainstream media news channels. They'll be using the same word. They indoctrinate you with certain words. Somebody has taken and shown the words in a like back by back, back by back to show every different network saying the same words, using the same phrase. Where do you think they got those phrases? Someone gave them to them. It's part of a plan. Threats, threats of violence and restrictions of freedom. We've seen that. To control or instill fear, threaten people with psychological damage, putting them in a state of constant fear and anxiety. We've seen that played out in the last few years, right? People afraid, afraid to go out of their house. People afraid of this, afraid of that, afraid to go to church. Fear is from Satan. And God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but love, you are loved. Power, you have the power of the Holy Spirit and a sound mind. Amen? So when your mind starts trying to go all cuckoo and start getting fearful, you take authority over it. And you say, in the name of Jesus' mind, you will believe the word of God. I forbid you to speak lies to me. I cast down every imagination and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God's word. Amen? And this word is what sets us free, and it keeps us free. Do not forsake the word of God. Amen? Amen. Bind it to your heart, the Bible says. Guard your heart with all diligence. To guard your heart, you better guard your mind. Amen? And so there's false flags. That's another thing they do. They'll release false information or carry out a fake terror attack to instill fear. However, the blame's put on another group or organization to gain control over the masses and shift opinion. So they'll go set up schemes and do something evil, and then they'll say, this group did it. And then you go, oh, no, I don't want to identify with that group. Oh, I don't like that. And then people back off. The Lord spoke to me when I was counting the cost of this message in this book, and he said, my soul has no delight in those who shrink back in fear. I want to delight the Lord. I want to bring honor to him. And so I'll be bold and courageous. Will you join me? Will you join me? <laughs> Films, music, and books can act as tools for psychological warfare. They get people to cower instead of speak up. Second Corinthians tells us that with unveiled faces, because we know the Lord, that we see the glory of the Lord, and it transforms us into His image. Do not be transformed into their image, amen, into the image they want to transform your children into, in the image of what they're trying to push and uh, push on your kids and all of these agendas. We have no fear of them, the Bible says in Matthew, for nothing is concealed that will not be revealed or kept secret that will not be made known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered in the ear, proclaim it upon the rooftops, and do not be afraid, amen. Jesus told us he didn't come to bring 
bring peace. He came to bring a sword, amen? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of the Lord. That's what transforms people. So, you know, we were not too long ago, we were in Italy several years back. So my, my lovely daughter in love, Alexis, she always, from the time she was a little girl, she saw some movie, right? <laughs> and it planted a seed. She wanted to be married in Italy. And she said, I don't need many people there. It can just be family, but I'd love to be married in Italy. So we were like, okay, we can all make that happen. And they found a monastery on top of a mountain. All right, this monastery was where they were going to have their wedding, and it was going to be an amazing event, but we had to orchestrate some of the moms and grandmas. I went ahead of Pastor Gary because he was preaching here for you. I went ahead with uh, Stacy, the, the bride's mom, the bride's grandma, the bride's aunt, and her brother. And so I was to drive the bride and the groom in a car up to the monastery two hours from Rome on roads I've never been on in a language I've not spoken and just try to do my best, right? Love Italy, though. It's a beautiful place. It's gorgeous. And so anyway, we were there at the uh, bus station, the train station. We figured out they were not going to fit in my car, even though it was supposedly a van. They've got these really tiny vehicles they call a van, right? And there was no way those folks were going to fit. So they were going to have to ride on the train and then a bus to this little town, San Sepulcro, and they were supposed to be picked up at the bus station. My job was to drive the bride and groom two and a half hours with all of their luggage, get the luggage from all the grandma and the aunt and everybody on them in the car, drive it up to the monastery, and come back and pick them up at a bus stop that I knew not where it was. And then, so I drive two hours, and we are squeezed in there with luggage. Actually, Tom had luggage in his lap. He couldn't see out or anything. We drove like that for two hours. It was getting close to time, because those are windy roads through mountains, right? It was windy. We get finally to where the monastery is supposed to be, and there's no room. Even if I dump the luggage, I can't put Tom and Alexis in the car and fit all the other people. So I drive up this mountain. What I did not know is instead of having switchbacks like most mountains have, it was a road straight up. I mean, it was straight up. Our wheels were spinning. That's how straight up it was, right? And there was only one curve up there, no guardrails. You could fall off the mountain both sides. It's like, oh my gosh. And then straight up again, I dumped them real quick. I dumped their luggage. And then I took off right back down the hill as hard as I could go, knowing grandma's going to be at the bus stop and I got to find the bus stop. Amen? So I'm driving through town. I'm praying in the spirit as hard as I can. I mean, I don't know what to do. I'm like, Lord, please help me. Please help me. This is an Italian grandma on top of that. I had already seen her spunk. I want to make sure I found her. Amen. And so I'm praying in the spirit. I see a fire station. I pull up. I roll down the window and I'm thinking, I'm by myself. It's gotten dark now. I don't know what to do. I don't know where the bus station is. I'm like, bus station. It doesn't matter how slow you say the words. It doesn't help bus station. You know, I'm trying to like charades and all of that. And he just pointed to town. So I didn't even know that was the way town was, but I found that out. So I started driving toward town. I came to this walled city, and I, I keep going straight, and I see a bus coming toward me. I'm like, praise God, it's a bus, right? <laughs> God's used this before, the FedEx agent, right? And I followed him all the way in, and we won the contest. So I'm like, yes, a bus, but he's coming toward me, and I'm coming this way. I spin around in the road and follow him, and I hug his bumper till he gets to a bus stop. And when he stops, I'm praying in the spirit, hoping this is the right bus. Amen. And I see grandma get off the bus and I'm rejoicing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I see the aunt. I see the brother. I'm like, yay, Jesus. Right. And so they get in my car, but I, I'll tell you, there was still not enough room in the car. Stacy, the mom of the bride, she had to uh, kind of scrunch down and hold onto the back of the headrest of my seat driving. Her grandma, the mother is sitting behind her, the grandma. She's sitting behind her. Her mother in love is sitting behind her. She's holding on to the headrest. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, oh Lord, they have no idea. We're about to climb the mountain again. That's how I feel with you. I feel like we're about to climb the mountain again, and we've got to know what's coming. We got to know, amen, what's happening. There's some things, there's some mountains to climb, and you have the ability. Get your muscles ready, get worked out, get ready to climb, because we've got work to do for the end time, amen? And so we get to the place, and I go, guys, we're going to be going straight up a mountain. I mean, it's straight up. And so we start up, and they're all screaming and wooing and weeing, and I'm praying. I'm praying, Lord Jesus, please don't 
don't let me go off the mountain. Please don't let me. Okay, no guardrails, no anything, you know. So we get up there to the top, praise the Lord. Everybody gets situated. And then I get the word. The next morning, Stacy and I go out and we try to find all the things we need for the wedding. It's on a Monday. Everything's closed. The floor is closed. Everybody's closed. And every time Stacy tried to call, they all spoke Italian in this little bitty town and nobody could communicate. So we just thought, when we get there, we'll find the Lord will provide, right? The Lord will provide what we need. And he did, praise the Lord. But I get this uh, word that Pastor Gary got delayed in New York and that their flight didn't get out. And so Amy, Jason, and Gary are stuck in the airport in New York City. And they're going to hopefully be in the next day, an hour before the wedding. Wow, we're down to the wire. Amen. God says he'll do a quick work in the end. We're down to the wire. Woo, we get everything ready. It's all fixed pretty. I go in to try to get me pretty because I look really bad. After driving, staying in a monastery, going to town, shopping, staying up with everybody, coaching everybody, trying to fix all the things, get the food ready, everything. It was crazy wild fun. I like it, right? Anyway, I like a little pressure. Yeah, (laughs) it's the way I'm wired. So anyway... Pastor Gary comes in the next day, and it's literally 45 minutes before the wedding. I run in there to try to get ready. The bride looks beautiful. All the decorations, everything looks beautiful. I run in there, and I think, I don't have time to wash my hair. I grab the dry shampoo. I unscrew the lid, and I dump it in my head. But what I don't realize is it's not the squirt applicator. It's the refill bottle. I dump the whole bottle over my head. My hair is white, pasty, and dry. My face is white as a sheet. I mean, it was why? I tried to scrub my face. I tried to brush my hair. I tried to curl it. It would not curl. If you put enough of that dry shampoo in there, nothing's going to happen with your hair. It won't move. It is just like stiff. I look like an old granny hair. I mean, seriously, really old granny hair. And so I've got this white complexion. I'm trying to get, and we've got to wear a black dress. I said it was my first goth look. So anyway, But when we sat down in the outdoors and we saw the beautiful leaves and we saw all the amazing things there, Tom read his vows to Alexis, she read her vows to him, and we all wept and the anointing of God was there. That's where we are right now. The mountains may look steep. You may feel like, I don't even know how to navigate this stuff. This is crazy. You may feel inadequate and you may feel like you're not put together. I understand. I get it. That's how I felt going into the wedding. But you know what? When the presence of God shows up, it doesn't matter that we might have a few things, you know, that aren't together. It doesn't matter that we may have been shaken up a little bit or that we've climbed some tough mountains. And some of you have climbed some tough mountains, and there may be some more tough mountains to climb. But if God be for you, amen, who can be against you? God loves you today. He cares for you. His anointing, his power is there. And he will see you through to the wedding feast. Jesus is with us. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In John 17, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe through them. You. Jesus prayed for you and me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may become as we are, one. I in them and you in me, that they may be with me where I am. Do you know when Jesus left the earth, he prayed about you being with him where he is? Isn't that beautiful? The mountain of the Lord is beautiful. And so we've got some things to do as the body of Christ. It's your time. It's your time. Are you going to be bold? Are you going to be courageous? Are you going to stand up to God's kingdom and hold up his kingdom to the world? Are you going to shrink back in fear? It's your time. So I'm going to pray with you now. If you would just bow your head. Lord, you said that for such a time as this, we've come into the kingdom. Lord, we're like John the Baptist. We're one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way and the pathway for the Lord. Lord, we know that your coming is near, it's at hand, but we have work to do. There are many, many who do not know you, especially children. So, Lord, we ask for a Holy Ghost boldness on the body of Christ. Lord, every one of us saying yes to you right now in our own spirit, saying yes, saying yes. Lord, we say yes. Yes, God. We'll not shrink back in fear. We'll not be quiet. We'll not be silent. We'll not be shut up, shut down. 
but we will stand up as the church of Jesus Christ and be bold as a lion. Lord, I pray for any that may not know you watching online or in Powell or in this auditorium. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've tried to live your own life your own way, God has a plan for your life. And if we try to do it our way, it never works out. I know I tried it. It didn't work. But when I surrendered my life and gave it to Christ, when I gave it to Jesus and said, be my Savior, and then I let him come in my life and change and transform me, and he became my Lord, not just my Savior, but my Lord. That transformed everything in my life. It's given me a good life. And so today, if you have never received Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. If you've never received Jesus and you'd like to say, yes, God, you can do it online, you can do it in Powell, in this auditorium, just lift up your hand right there where you are and say, I receive you, Jesus. I need help, God. I'm at my wit's end. I feel like someone, God brought you here to this place. You saw this today because you've been trying to do it your way and God's saying it won't work. Surrender your life. Surrender your life. Just say, Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Take my life. I give it to you. I surrender. I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I receive you. And thank you for transforming me into a new person in Christ. All the sin, the old things are all passed away. And everything becomes new. I get a fresh start. I don't have to change my gender or change my name or change my body to get a fresh start. I get a fresh start in Jesus the right way, the righteous way, God's way. I receive you, Lord, as my Savior. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving me today. You matter to God. You are one of a kind. He loves you. You're the apple of his eye. He created you as a father with love. Every single person is unique, and God designed them. You are a God designed with God DNA. Do not let anyone lie to you. Don't let Satan steal who you are in Christ. You were created to be a child of God, and you are created to receive the Holy Spirit that you would be bold, that you would be courageous, that the Holy Spirit would lead you. The Holy Spirit is your friend, counselor, teacher, will show you the way to go. He's not let me down. He's led me through all these years. Jesus is my Savior, and the Holy Spirit is my counselor. And between the two of them and my Father that loves me, God has given me an amazing life, and He wants to do the same for you too. Praise the Lord.